Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello to another episode of the Word of Mouth podcast. It is a joy to be with you as always. My name is Michael Horn. I am the host of the show. I am with Philip Wolk today, and Philip is a 26-year-old IT worker at Edward Jones, and it's great to be with him. He's going to talk a little bit about his faith journey with us today and kind of uh, his dreams and mission and, and the blessings and challenges he's experienced in his own life and just his thoughts on evangelization as well. So I just want to remind our listeners again before we begin uh, and to talk about Philip, we just want to remind you all that you can find us at any podcast app that you can find. So anything like Apple Podcasts or Google Play, if you subscribe to those, if you go to Stitcher or any other podcast app, you just search for the Archdiocese of St. Louis to find us. And once you've subscribed, make sure you rate us and share us with your friends. Just to remind you again that you have to search for the Archdiocese of St. Louis, and you might have to dig just a little bit. You'll see the Catholic Gateway podcast in there. You'll also see the Word of Mouth podcast cast. And so it's great to be with you as always again. And Philip, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing today, Michael? Great. Thank you so much for being with us, and we look forward to kind of listening to your story. So as we get started today, the first thing we just would like our listeners to know about you is just kind of a little bit about your faith journey and the encounters that you've had with God and how you've experienced God in your own life as you have lived about 26 years now. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> so growing up, I was always a cradle Catholic. I'm the oldest of eight children, and I've always been all about following the faith. And I've done a lot of Bible stories, lives of the saints, prayers. My family and I, we always say the rosary every Sunday. As a family, that's a big part of our faith. Growing up, I also... Went to PSR first through eighth grade. I went to public school, and my confirmation saint was St. Sebastian. He was just a big inspiration to me, and he was like a Roman soldier that stood up for his faith, basically, and a good martyr for the church. And as far as like my interest, I'm a big fan of the blues. I love to go for walks. I love reading C.S. Lewis, and I do like to play Xbox once in a while. <laughs> I really do like to spend time with family and friends, and I'm a really outgoing person. I really like to talk to others and get to know them and learn more about them. And as far as, like, outside of Mass and church, I like to go to, like, adoration, and I like to go to confession at least twice a month. And then I also really enjoy my sacramentals. I have a St. Benedict medal, and I have a cross that I wear, too. Those are important for my faith too. Mm -hmm. so Awesome, sure. And can you talk a little bit about kind of your involvement with young adult ministry here in St. Louis and how that's kind of shaped your faith? I'm also a part of, I go to St. Louis Young Adults Ministry. I go to the Theology on Taps and the Nazareth Nights when I get a chance. Both those instances are a really good way to get to hear talks and learn more about the faith and different perspectives from different speakers. Also, the Nazareth Nights, they're good because you can meet up with people afterwards, just like the Theology on Taps, and you can meet a bunch of young adults and like-minded people. Mm -hmm. um, those are really important because the faith community is what brings you closer to the church, too. Sure. Amen. And as you look back on your faith journey and as it's continuing to grow today, just can you talk to us a little bit about some encounters that you may have had with the Lord or any experiences that really kind of stood out in your mind and that you remember today as vivid encounters with the Lord? How can you talk about your relationship with God in kind of like a personal way? Um, I did have one time where I was at Mass with my dad and my brothers, and we were looking at the Eucharist when it was raised at Mass. Mm -hmm. And when it was raised, there was a ray of light coming across out of the window and reflecting off the Eucharist. And my dad was like, said to somebody else behind us, do you see that bright light? Like, we couldn't look at the, mm -hmm. the Eucharist itself. And we had to look down, basically, because mm -hmm. it was so bright. I think that was one of the biggest faith experiences I've had. Mm -hmm. As far as other things, just like going to Mass every week, and like I said, saying the rosary, I say the rosary daily, and that helps with my faith journey, too. I try to keep 30 minutes of prayer every day for myself, sure. too. So Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. And as you look like, at your faith journey and how it's shaped you today, what would you say it's leading you towards as far as a vocation or a mission or any dreams that you have with your life? So where do you kind of plan to go in the future, and 
maybe where you are now is kind of where you want to be, but do you have any kind of aspirations or dreams for the future? What do you feel called to do in your life, Philip? I feel my mission is to help people, communicate with people, and be a presence. At my job, I work for Edward Jones. I do IT help desk, so I'm helping people on a daily basis with their computer issues. I always like to be a team player and love to make sure everybody's okay and doing okay. I do feel that God has called me to the married life, but I haven't met the woman yet that I'm supposed to be with. I just want to have a family someday, too, and one of my life goals is to uh, visit some hockey arenas and visit Canada because I'm a big hockey fan, so visiting a few arenas would be pretty cool. Sure, sure. And obviously, your current family situation, being in a very large, kind of closely knit family, that's kind of shaped your vocation, would you say, definitely? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. And so... As we move on, uh, just kind of looking at your vision for the future and and where God is calling you, what are some of the blessings and challenges that you've experienced just through your faith journey, through your life, and just the many paths that you've traveled kind of in your life thus far? What are those main kind of blessings that you've experienced and maybe some, some setbacks as well? I would say the biggest challenge has been I've struggled with anxiety throughout my life. Mm -hmm. It's been really tough. Uh, There's been a few times where I've just been like down, but I'm one of those people that never gives up and I've got the right help and using my faith that that really helps me get through what I need to get through and prayer. And that's probably the biggest challenge I've had. As far as like blessings, I've had a really nice family, good job, good friends, good education, everything that I need, I have for the most part. I really don't need all kinds of material things. You know, it's just, it's more so like the community and my family and That's basically what I need. Sure. And for our listeners, what would you say is the meaning of evangelization? So especially coming from you as a young adult, what does it mean in your life to be an evangelist? What does it mean to evangelize? Evangelization to me is to help others understand the Lord and to bring them closer to the Lord. The biggest thing these days is a lot of people are alone and separated. And I think that's part of the reason why a lot of people do have anxiety, kind of like how I did. I know that people need others to get closer to the Lord. And in order to do that, you have to spread the Word of God throughout the world. You have to reach out to the community, reach out to other people. Maybe it's just sitting with somebody you don't know, mm-hmm. you know, or sure. talking to somebody you don't know. Right. Yeah, I think that's very good. It is certainly being open to inviting others to a community to an event to a group. I think that's really important. And we've covered the idea and the importance of community in, in another episode that we did with the Word of Mouth podcast. So that's a really great theme to highlight and the importance of community and living your faith and growing in holiness and growing in to becoming the person that you're called to be. So thank you very much for those reflections, Philip. We're just going to transition now into the catechetical segment of our episode today. And so with Philip being one of eight children and a very close-knit family, just the dynamic of beauty within that family, we're going to talk about basically the gospel of the family and certainly reference chapter 7 of Amoris Laetitia. And so we'll just talk about kind of the importance and value of the family today and how it can really shape us and mold us into really great human beings and kind of guide us as we pursue our goals and vocations in this life. And so it's really important that parents and children understand that moral formation must happen in the family. And so parents are charged with this great task of forming their children in the moral life and guiding them and presenting a good example to them of how to live a good Christian life. And so in this process, there's a call to an inculcation of virtue. And so parents are charged, like I said, with this responsibility to really instill virtue, to instill a sense of a good moral compass in the lives and hearts of their children. And so it is very important for parents to show their children how to be courageous, how to be prudent, how to be kind and self-sacrificing. And so like Philip mentioned, those moments of just kind of inviting someone who feels alone and welcoming someone into a community. So embracing those virtues that can really lead others to holiness in addition to ourselves. And so the family has been called by the church many times the school of virtue. So it is the place where we learn how to act, how to live the Christian life, how to be disciples of the Lord in many ways. And so there's lots of correction that we need. As we grow up, some of us are not the most pleasant children. We're not the most well-behaved all the time. And so in our family, we need that correction from our parents. And so we need to be children who are lovingly corrected, 
and feel cared for in many ways. And so just because a parent is disciplining us, it doesn't mean that there's a lack of love. It, it means that there's authentic love there. And so that's what we're called to. And I know that I'm certainly grateful for the model that my parents set in my life to discipline me when I was out of line and to correct me when I was wrong with various behaviors. So that's a blessing and that's that's a call to the modern family today is to consider how correction is undertaken in the family. And so in our society today, we tend to indulge children too much at various times, I think, and there's too much care for children's desires, but we need to be concerned with the moral formation of children and of youth in the world today. And so we need to know both our rights and responsibilities as family members. So we all have to care for one another. We have to know what is good and what will be best for our siblings, for our parents, for our children, whatever it might be. And so as we journey through the Christian life, we're always attracted to obviously the model of Jesus Christ and Mary and Joseph and the rest of the saints. And so we're very attracted to imitate the good person, the good people that we encounter in our lives. And so hopefully these parents in our families today are the good persons that really model that behavior for us. And I'm sure Philip can attest to that, just the role of his parents and kind of shaping him and who he is today. So that's a beautiful blessing when we have great parents who kind of raise a family that's really dedicated to virtue and pursuing the good. So the family, as I mentioned before, is a school of virtue. It's also a school of human values where people learn the wise use of our human freedom and to use it in a way that's best for everyone, not only ourselves, but it involves self-sacrificing love for the rest of the members. And so when our families break down, the primary school of values and virtue is lacking in many ways. So whether it's lacking a parent or lacking the guidance and help or mentorship of of an older sibling, whatever it might be. So there's a lot of things that can struggle when our family is breaking down. And so the rules that a family has is for the sake of the mission of the family. And so the rules, quote unquote, might be so that we pray a rosary every Sunday, like Philip mentioned in his family. That's a great idea to enter into prayer and to enter into the mysteries of the gospel through the eyes of Mary as a family and as a community and to enter into prayer together and to grow closer to one another and to God in the process. And so also something that's really important today is the family's teaching on sexuality and how parents decide to raise their children, the teaching on sexuality. So it has to be rooted in love and an understanding of willing the good of another, because I think that helps us put things in perspective in many ways. And and so Pope John Paul II was very big on just understanding that we cannot reduce the human person to an object, but that there is always a subjective element to us as humans. And so we can never just simply use someone. And so that's kind of the emphasis is that we must continue to teach one another in our family lives that sexuality must be rooted in love and desire for the the true authentic well-being of the other person. And so another virtue that I've talked a lot recently with friends is the virtue of modesty, that is just kind of a natural approach that we can defend our personal privacy and prevent ourselves from becoming these objects to be used, as John Paul II would point out in documents like Love and Responsibility and his Theology of the Body, a series of audiences that he presented in Rome. And so those are a couple of things to keep in mind when we think of the family, just kind of instilling virtue, understanding sexuality, understanding discipline, and understanding the true freedom that we're called to. And so it's important for us to ask the question, because we all come from a family, so this applies to all of us, what do we worship in our family? What is most important? What do we hold dear in our families today? Is it power? Is it status? Is it money? Is it academic achievement? Or is it love, virtue, and God himself? So we all worship something in our lives, and so we're called by God to order those things that we place value upon to honor his glory and to honor his presence in our lives. And so that's a question for us always to think of, what are we valuing most? What do we hold dear in our families? And so another thing to really emphasize in our families today, and we had a guest several months back, Mr. Alan Schwab, who talked about how he came into the church because of the great teaching on marriage and sexuality and the family that our church has. And so 
he mentioned this idea as well. And I know that Bishop Barron is another one that advocates this principle as well, very much about the transcendent third. What does this transcendent third mean? It means basically in a friendship or marriage or a family situation, there are two people who fall in love with each other, and there's bond there that's very strong. But there's also a third thing, this transcendent third thing, that they both share a rich love for, and they hold something dear. And so, for example, it might be love itself, it might be one's country, it might be God, or truth, whatever it might be. And it allows the friendship to endure. And so people that are called to marriage, like, like Philip's talking about. So there's a love between the spouses, obviously, for one another, but they also share a love of something that's greater than themselves, whether it is God or the mission that they share together as a married couple. And the children that are the fruit of a marriage also kind of reflect that transcendent third. There's this one more thing that we add to this. And so I have a great friend who shall remain nameless, just don't want to embarrass him if he's embarrassed by this, but he has this great picture on Facebook of him with his wife. When she was pregnant, they have this picture that just basically says one plus one equals three. And so it's conveying this truth that spousal love generates this third person. And it's so beautiful in that way to think of it that way. And so that's another task that we're called to embrace as family members to continue to teach one another, whether it is our children or our siblings, just the value of this transcendent third. And so that's something else for us to keep in mind. And then I just want to reference paragraph 230 of Amoris Laetitia as well. And this quote about A couple's love attains the height of freedom, and each spouse realizes that the other is not his or her own, but has a much more important master, the one Lord. And so it's always God whom we belong to first and foremost. And so that there is this love between couples um, that enables us to attain this great height of freedom. But there's a realization that even though you might love the other and the other might love you, that God's love is still primary and most powerful in that relationship. And so we look at people in the Bible, for example, that really embraced radical family values on this topic as well and understanding that God is master and that God is the Lord of our lives. And so, for example, Hannah in the Old Testament is given a son, Samuel, who then is given back to the Lord, that she gives this gift of her son, back to the Lord out of great gratitude. And so he's surrendered to the Lord's service. And so another example, we think of um, Elizabeth and Zechariah in the New Testament, and they have this child, John the Baptist, after being barren for so long, and he's dedicated completely 100% to his mission of pointing out the Christ to other people. And so he is the one, this voice in the wilderness, who is crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. And he's the one who directs hearts and minds to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, who has come to the world. And so we just can think about that as we assess just the beauty of marriage and spousal love and the beauty of family values being instilled in the context of the family. And so in a marriage, these two people together fall in love with God and each other. And so they fall in love with God together, and that's kind of the source and root of a great family is that the spouses fall in love together with God. And so just to close this section on the calling of the family and the gospel of the family and how evangelization can take place in a family in many different ways, it's just important for the family today also to promote religious vocations and the mission that God has given to each person. And so obviously not everyone is called to a religious vocation or the priesthood, but it's important to as a parent, be someone who is really seeking the best interests of your child and what the particular vocation that they have received from God is. And so when you think about that, maybe it's a call to marriage, like in Philip's case, maybe it's a call to a certain religious community, maybe it's a call to diocesan priests or whatever it might be, but to support and really advocate for your child and whatever a mission and vocation that they have been entrusted with by God. And so that wraps up our catechesis on the gospel of the family. And so we just continue to pray for guidance um, in our family today and that we might uphold values that truly resonate with the message of the gospel, themes like love and self-sacrificing love and virtue and living the moral life and being more open to understanding the gift and the virtue of chastity and modesty and embracing purity for the sake of just 
our interior lives and, and entering more fully into understanding where God is leading us in our lives and, and growing in holiness and being people that can really live the lives that we're called to be. And it's certainly a challenge that we face in the world today to foster these virtues, but that's the goal of our Christian life, to become saints. And so the Church gives us this example and teaches us about the Gospel so that we might attain an existence that's greater than that which we currently possess. And so we're always called to seek those higher things and to become the best version of ourselves, as Matthew Kelly would say. And so as we transition and wrap up this catechesis on the family today, we're just going to close with some final reflections from Philip on his practical tips for evangelization. So when we seek to evangelize today, some practical things that we can take on in our daily lives. Thank you, Michael. I would say daily prayer is probably one of the most vital things. Going to Mass, frequenting the sacraments, Mass confession, those are the two big ones. Fostering the family life and community life, making sure that you reach out to your family and friends and are able to be with them and spend time with them. Taking people out, maybe even to share a meal with them, or when you take them out, maybe even share your faith, your struggles, your personal encounters with the Lord, and what's going on in your life. Going up to people, telling them, hey, look, is everything going well in your life? Even a simple phone call, you know, like to somebody can really help them and give them a chance to be like, hey, you okay, man? Or what's going on? Or it really does make someone's day. I'd say another way is to take up your cross daily. Whatever your cross is, we all have crosses to bear in our lives. So whatever cross that you have, accept it and go up to the Lord and offer it up to him and we all have, as Christians and Catholics and any other listeners out there, we all have a cross that we go through and we have to bear each and every day. And then when you're at work, I would try to console and comfort people and just reach out to people like at work and talk to them and make conversation with them and see where they are in their faith if, if, if the opportunity arises. There's always an opportunity to reach out and evangelize with people um, in the faith, and I think that's important when you talk to somebody and just see where they're at because everybody's in different spots in their lives and everybody's got different challenges and crosses. But we should reach out to people and make sure that everything is going well and what they're doing in their lives is helpful. So, Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you very much, Philip, for those those thoughts on evangelization. I think, again, those, those are really important small actions that we can take, those random acts of kindness, invitations, community, just being open and vulnerable with people and just kind of sharing our crosses and our struggles that we have with other people just to kind of help them grow as well. And I'm thinking of a great letter. I think it's Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. He talks about kind of how this gift that we have received this consolation from God in our struggles. And so he comforts us in our struggles so that we might also comfort people in their struggles. And so that's just a great calling for us as we seek to evangelize in that way as well, to be people that are hospitable, to be people that are community-oriented and, and reach out and take that initiative, like you said, to to reach out to people who we know that may be going through a difficult time right now, whether they're friends or family members, and just kind of spending that time with them to listen, to console them, to comfort them if necessary, and just to really be open with them so that they might see Christ in us. So thank you again for your thoughts on evangelization and just kind of sharing your faith journey with us. So that's it's been great. And I just want to remind our listeners as we wrap up today, just that you can, again, subscribe to us, please. Uh, when you when you find us, we can be found at the SoundCloud account with the Archdiocese of St. Louis. And you can also find us on any other podcast app like Google, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, whatever it might be. And uh, you'll just search for the Word of Mouth podcast and just be sure that you, uh, you rate us and share us with your friends as well. So again, my name is Michael Horn. I'm the host of Word of Mouth, and I've been with Philip Wolk today. And it's been an absolute blessing to be with you all as we kind of journey through the Christian life more and more as we progress. Just know of our prayers for you, and we ask you to keep us in your prayers as well. So thank you very much to all of you for listening, and thank you very much, Philip. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we will catch you next time at Word of Mouth. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.